Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome you in the first IAF uh, webinar. Um, um, as you know all that due to COVID-19, we must change our habits and we have to create new ways of uh, working, new ways of sharing our experience, our feelings and new ways of debating. That's why uh, IAF has decided to create this uh, IAF webinars. Uh, we're gonna have one IAF webinar today for uh, all the situation in Europe, another one tomorrow uh, for all uh, Latin and uh, Central America situation, and another one on Thursday regarding Asia, Middle East and Africa situation. Just a few words to remind that the goal of IF is to exchange information and experience between lawyers in the field of football law. But our purpose is also to value, to assert the activity of football lawyers that we all the members and the speakers today are very uh, um, expert in football law. As you may know, COVID-19 has played the football worldwide in an incredible situation. I mean, a situation that no one uh, would have imagined, no one had anticipated what is going on right now. So this situation has been qualified as a cas de force majeure by FIFA. This decision is far reaching since force majeure produces significant legal effects, particularly on contracts. Nevertheless, in uh, their, its guidelines, FIFA doesn't draw any consequences on the effect that this force majeure may have on the contracts between, I'm talking about the contract between clubs and players and coaches. On the contrary, FIFA leaves it up to the contracting parties to find contractual solutions to deal with the situation. FIFA is expecting cooperation. FIFA is expecting all its national association to comply with its guidelines, but it recognizes, FIFA is recognizing that clubs and their employees must comply with their national law, their national CBA, and that they have to cooperate in order to find solutions. The thing is, FIFA has already indicated what would be the criteria in case there is no national law, no national CBA, no agreement. We have a kind of guidelines of what the, uh, uh, the dispute resolution chamber will take into consideration in case there is amendments imposed by the employers to the employees, by the clubs to the coaches and the players. So we have decided to focus this webinar on the point two of the guidelines. Of course, there are a lot of to, to, to say, we, we could talk about transfer, we could talk about loans, about uh, many things. This will be addressed in a, uh, the few weeks, maybe two or three weeks in a new IF webinar. Today, we have decided to focus our discussion, our debate on the, the topic of agreements that cannot be performed as the parties originally anticipated. It's how FIFA has uh, designed this specific topic. So the, the objective of this webinar is to present the existing situation in each country. What are the update regulations, law or CBAs or agreement in each country regarding remuneration, regarding Remuneration, I mean, limitation of wages, wages reduction or wages deferral. What are the measures affecting the contract? 
Is there uh, any protection mechanism in your country? Is there some insurance coverage? These are the information we would like to share between us. What are the measures? Could be governmental measures or federation measures that have been taken for the reception of the training and compensation? And what are the measures that have been or are going to be taken uh, in case the authority decide to resume the competition? This is to uh, explain the the, what, why we're going to focus on this topic. So I'm going to start the, the webinar uh, to present the situation in France. Next, we will be we will have Sébastien Ledur for Belgium, then Franz de Weger, who will explain the situation in Netherlands, which is very interesting since it is the first country who has decided to stop the competition. Then Juan de Dios, who will explain the situation in Spain. Then Joachim Rhein for Germany, Stefano Laporta for Italy, Carol Coes for UK, Pedro Massineira for Portugal, and last but not least, Emin Oskot for Turkey. These are all the main championship, and you are all, uh, my dear colleagues, member of IF, and I'm very happy and I would like to grant you and thank you for uh, being uh, here with us and accept to share what you know, your knowledge about the situation. So let's go to the situation in France. The situation in France has changed just one hour ago. Um, two hours ago, we all believed that the championship will resume in a few weeks. And our prime minister has just announced, one hour at 4 p.m., announced that professional competition should stop. So we were a little bit astonished because I'm not sure that he has power to decide this and it's not exactly a decision, but due to this situation of COVID-19, things are changing every hour. So it's very new and I can update you right now about the situation. Nevertheless, we have in France one law calling uh, partial unemployment, partial activity, actually it's, the real name is partial activity, who uh, is uh, provided by the, the Labour Code, Article 5122 of the Labour Code, who allow, which allow the employers to put their employees in what we call partial activity. This is the law. On the 25th of March, the government set up a decree which has made much easier the mechanism to access to this partial activity. It's very important to understand that in front, this mechanism of partial activity is considered to prevent the termination of the employment contract. This is very important. I will explain if in a few minutes how it works, the mechanism. But first of all, it's important to understand that because uh, this system allow the employer to put their employees, and this applies to players and to coaches, in partial activity, some academics believe that this mechanism prevent employers from invoking force majeure as a basis for breaching the contracts. I think this is very important because in, like in many countries, in French law, the French law provides that force majeure is a case of breach of fixed term contract, contract but only if force majeure renders the execution of the contract impossible. 
So if we look at the contract, players contract and coach contracts, which is pretty different for artist contract. Some artist contract, they have contracts for two, three days. And for sure, it's considered that impossible to execute. But for players and coach contract, since we have this mechanism of partial activity, there are some academics, I uh, talked with, their, with them yesterday and two days ago, they, they consider that it means that for clubs, it's not impossible to execute the contract, to perform the contracts, since this mechanism exists. And they think that the court, the French court, would not allow a club to terminate a contract on the basis of the force majeure because of the existence of the system. So how this mechanism works? The decree, the 25th of March decree, has put it very easier. Now the club, they don't need to ask the administration a previous authorization. It's not no longer a prerequisite to put the employee on partial activity. The employers, they have 30 days after placing its employee into partial activity to submit the, his application to the administration. The staff representative in the, in the club uh, can be consulted afterwards. Normally it was previous putting the employees in partial activity. Now it makes it very easy and they can be consulted after. So all the employees and the, the players and the coach, they have been put in the situation that they, 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 didn't, they were not warned about the, the application of the mechanism and they just learn it without discussion, without agreement, the employee cannot refuse the partial activity. The partial activity provoke the suspension of the contract, only the suspension of the contract. And it's not considered as a modification of the contract. This means that the players and coaches cannot raise the issue of a breach of contract because of being put in partial activity. Of course, the measure, measure should be collective. It cannot be, you cannot put one player in partial activity and the others, you, 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 you pay all everything, all the, the, the wages. And uh, the, 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 the player, when he knows that, he will know that when he received by receiving his pay slip. And then the pay slip, he will have two parts in the pay slip. One part is the day in March, for instance, the pay slip in March, you have one page uh, with the wages uh, regarding the days when the player uh, was employed, was uh, in, in activity, and another page with the days and the, the rate where during the, the, the player and the coaches were not in activity. The mechanism allowed the, 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 the employer to pay only 70% of the wages, which means around 84% of the net wages, 70% of the gross salary paid, they paid to the employee, to the, the, the players and the coach. What is important for the, the, the clubs is that there are no social contribution on this 70% or 84% of the net wages paid no social contribution except one, which is CSG and CRDS, means around 10%. So it represents a substantial saving for the clubs. Okay. Nevertheless, uh, the employers, what do they receive from the government? They receive from the government a benefit, which is equivalent to 70% of the gross, but 
of course, it is capped to a maximum of 7,000 euro. So for players or coaches which have a big, big wages, the employers get only maximum 7,000 euro per player. So that's the legal uh, frame of the mechanism of partial activity. Most of the French clubs, they have implemented this mechanism in March and in April, but they try to negotiate with between union a special agreement. Nowadays, there is only one agreement which has been reached by the both union, but this agreement concerns only the wages of April. And what does it say? It says that part of the wages, part of the indemnity, we call that indemnity, uh, uh, which is due under partial activity, depending of the amount of the wages, part of this indemnity, only a part, will be defer later on, later on it was when the competition will restart or when the competition will be stopped. So it's only a deferral the measure and it's an, an, an agreement, but individual, but each player has to agree on an individual basis to this deferral. So the agreement is not very uh, in, interesting for clubs since the, 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 all the player, they have to agree for this deferral and this agreement concerns only April. So now we just realize and uh, we learn that the competition will not, will probably not resume except if the French Federation and the French League says to the prime minister that he is not, he has not the power to make such a decision. But I can say that 90% for sure the French competition for the season 1920 will not resume. Uh, it means, what does it mean? It means that in my, my view that, uh, of course, the wages for May and June will be under the partial activity. Some clubs try to reach an agreement, individual agreement uh, with the player, mostly the, 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 the player who have big wages. But uh, as far as I know, there is no agreement where uh, the collectively the player had accepted to reduce their wages. The only some clubs reach agreement just for deferral uh, of the part of the indemnity which has to be paid uh, under partial activity. So this is the situation in France. Of course, I will be happy to answer any question. Uh, and now I give the floor to Sébastien Ledur. Sébastien, it's yours. Um, Thank you, Patricia, and hi to, to everyone at the office or at home. Um, happy to see some familiar faces uh, again and hope you're doing all well. Um, with respect to the situation in Belgium, the situation is obviously uh, similar to many countries, um, but yet it's also uh, different. The legal ground that is invoked in Belgium is indeed also the force majeure. Um, as uh, you know, it's principle, civil code principle that is applied in, in many jurisdictions and which actually is also the cornerstone of um, measures taken here in, uh, in Belgium. Um, contrary to France, we do not have a system of uh, partial activity. So the legal consequences of the current situation are actually quite easy to assess and they are threefold. Um, either employers and employees um, consider that an agreement falls within uh, the scope of the force majeure and hence it is uh, suspended. Mutual obligations are suspended, meaning that clubs are not obliged anymore to pay the salary of the players and not only the players, by the way, also of uh, the staff and administrative, uh, administrative staff. 
um, either they continue just to honor the contracts as it is, which is an option that is chosen by very few clubs, mostly top clubs, but it is. There are a few top clubs that have just decided to continue to pay out. Um, either a third option is obviously to negotiate and to arrive to any amendment to the current employment agreements, which can lead to compensation, anything in between zero and 100. That is very roughly set the situation um, that we are having currently in, in Belgium. Um, competition has been suspended on March 12th. Uh, which was the date where Belgian government and the Security Council of our country took decision, um, global decisions affecting the entire society and economy on how to deal with uh, the uh, COVID crisis. As of that government announcement, immediately the professional league, the pro league, decided to suspend its uh, championship. Uh, we were at 29 rounds out of 30, uh, which means we were at one round of the final phase of the regular season. In Belgium, we have a post-season, we have a playoff system. We are one of the very few countries in the world that have a playoff system. Um, so we were at the very end of the regular season, just before start of the um, playoffs. The decision was taken to suspend and for a, dura a duration that was actually equal to the duration of the measures taken by the federal government. So football authorities in Belgium, they have taken decisions the last two months step by step by step. They have actually followed what the guidelines uh, or, or even the, the measures were that were taken by the federal government. Federal government has initially said, well, we are going to ban I'm, resume, I'm summarizing here, we're going to, 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 to ban or, or, or to close public life, sorry, until uh, April 5th. Then it has been extended with the Easter holidays until April 19. And then for the third time, and that was last Friday, the government took decisions to extend it to uh, several dates, actually in the course of the month of May. So we had three decisions taken by the state and each time actually the football authorities, they were obliged to follow these guidelines. And so to say, as long as there is this government measure, we are not resuming uh, football. In the meantime, the decision was um, also taken, well, first of all, and just between brackets, there's a difference between amateur football and professional football. On amateur football, the Federation, Belgian Federation, very quickly took a decision to end all competitions for the remaining part of the 1920 season. For professional football, as I just explained, it has been extended each time for a certain period. And today, um, we are in a situation where the board of the professional league has advised the General Assembly of the league to also immediately end the championship. We were, I believe, the first country in Europe to have this recommendation. It was not a decision, it was a recommendation and it had to be validated by um, the General Assembly of the League. But because of the fact that the National Security Council, the government has still not officially said that no football activities are possible until the end of June, because of that, the Professional Football League also has not taken formally the decision. The government announced that they would take a decision uh, in the course of this week and uh, not later than yesterday, Professional Football League's General Assembly has been delayed until next Monday and they hope that in between the Security Council will take a final decision and then next Monday, most likely, the decision will be taken to end the uh, championship. Why is that? Why is there this link between the government uh, decision and the decision of the football authorities? It is related to the third condition of the force majeure. As Patricia already said, uh, it's the irresistible character of the force majeure. It's the absolute impossibility to execute 
a contractual engagement. And obviously, everyone knows, um, every uh, legally qualified person in Belgium knows that the debate and the disputes can precisely come from the interpretation on this, um, this third criterion. Case law in Belgium is very clear, and it's not sports-related case law, it's civil law. If an obligation is more difficult to execute, but not impossible, it's not a force majeure, and hence it's not a cause for suspension of contracts. Which means that um, the clubs are very cautious in taking these measures, and the professional league is very cautious. And it is also accepted by means of applications of another principle of law, um, which is called in French the fait du prince, the factum principis. That is that if you have a higher authority taking a decision which actually um, forbids you to perform the activity which is subject of the contract, well, then uh, there is let's say less doubt, there is less debate possible on whether or not the execution can be executed. So that's from the legal perspective and that explains why a professional league is waiting on the decision of the higher authority. Now, um, what does it mean for contracts? What we've seen in the meantime is actually that um, clubs have been taking more or less three positions. Very few clubs um, have decided to continue to pay everyone uh, and to pay all wages. A large, uh, a large number of clubs, on the other hand, have decided that they would apply a public uh, unemployment allowance system, which is not specific to sports. It's just part of our social security system and it applies to all employees. The government very quickly said that um, they would be less regarding or less harsh on people being put in this system since the outburst of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, it has actually resulted in a massive, massive application by all companies and hence also including by uh, many football teams of this system. This system actually allows for players, for employees, to call for um, a unemployment, a temporary unemployment allowance, which is kept, like in France, at 70% of uh, the gross salary. It's not 70% of the gross salary of the player salary. There is a cap, uh, unfortunately, for the players, but there is obviously a cap. This cap is even much lower than in France. It is, the reference salary is 2,754 euro for coaches, coaches, gross, and 2,352 euro gross for players. Of that amount, 70% a player or a coach can be paid a temporary unemployment allowance. So you can imagine that this is a very, very, there is a very big gap between what employees will earn under the public welfare system, the unemployment allowance, and what they actually were earning under their contract. So the second category of teams, which mostly are smaller teams with lower budgets, they have actually decided to use this system. And for the duration of the impossibility to play the championship, actually all employees are put in this uh, system. A third category is obviously the category of clubs that has decided to engage in talks with, um, with the players, knowing that there is no formal procedure foreseen by the law or in collective bargaining agreements. It has resulted in individual talks at the level of each club. And we have seen various uh, various situations. So there we are not anymore in the 100% application of the employment agreement or applying 0% but having a temporary an allowance, an, um, unemployment allowance. There we are actually in negotiations on contract amendments. And we have seen 
teams that have reached agreements with players on a month by month basis to reduce salary. Some proposed 20%. We even saw a team that went up to 50% of uh, the salary. We have seen a team that proposed for the next three months, April, May, and June, to say, players, you drop one month of salary and we will fully pay two of the remaining uh, months of the season. So we pay two out of three remaining uh, months. And actually, there was a variety of options. Again, it all comes down to an individual agreement, an individual understanding uh, at the level of clubs. And there is no mandatory procedure within the Joint Committee uh, for Sports or uh, uh, being an application of the collective bargaining agreements. What we did see, um, that is that despite the fact that uh, the contracts were uh, suspended because of force majeure by some teams, it's the second category I was referring to, that is nonetheless, um, a few elements of the agreement were still being applied. So for instance, uh, players were still granted the benefits in kind that they had in their contracts. They still received a car, they were still benefiting from housing if it was being granted by the team. So it has, let's say there has been some flexibility with the teams besides the salary to say we are still going to grant the, um, the benefits. Um, the signing fees that were uh, agreed in individual agreements, sign-on sign fees for players, they have also been enforced. So what we've actually seen is that the impact of the crisis is an impact on the salary, fixed salary, and obviously also bonuses because there are no games anymore. Um, but with respect to benefits, signing fees, or insurance pension schemes, the system has been maintained uh, so far. Maybe a uh, last word uh, on, on the impact is at this point, we haven't seen any court uh, disputes yet. Uh, we, we are not aware of any at this point. Uh, we also don't know to what extent the uh, COVID-19 crisis will be used by teams to also um, suspend or renegotiate agreements on agent fees. Um, that's something that uh, we haven't seen, but that is a side aspect, which actually at a certain point could also be raised. We have not seen that. Uh, I think I summarized more or less the essential characteristics, and I hope it was clear to you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for the, this very clear explanation. I give the floor to Franz de Weger for the Netherlands situation. Franz, yes. you have the floor. Wait a moment, sorry. Do you hear me? Uh... Yes, we, okay. we hear you and we can see you. Very good, very good. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Thank you, uh, Ronan, for the uh, invitation to speak and also this, uh, this great initiative. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to provide the participants with an update from a Dutch perspective. Um, as a starting point, and um, Patricia, you already referred to it, uh, I think it's interesting to note that um, our Dutch government has decided very recently to ban large scaled event, uh, events until the 1st of September 2020. And as a result, last Friday, our Dutch FA, they organized a video conference with all the Dutch professional football clubs uh, to discuss the situation and the next steps. And during this conference, uh, the Dutch FA officially decided uh, that the Dutch competition for the season 19-20 uh, uh, will not be continued and therefore the competition came to an end. Um, there are a few decisions which are interesting to share because I think the Netherlands, we are the first country where the competition is, uh, is ended. Uh, first of all, our Dutch FA decided not to call out the champion. Um, and regarding the champion, Champions League and UEFA tickets, our FA followed the UEFA guidelines, uh, reflecting the principle that admission to UEFA club competitions is based on sporting merit. Um, and regarding the consequence of the relegation and promotion, uh, the Dutch FA decided to invite the professional football clubs to inform the Dutch FA about their preference for this, 
more specifically whether or not the clubs wished that the concept of relegation and promotion had to be enforced. Uh, and although there was, a, there was only a minority, uh, 9 out of 34 clubs, that did not prefer relegation and promotion principles, our Dutch FA decided that relegation and promotion will not take place. Um, at the moment, it is uh, quite chaotic uh, here, to be uh, fully honest with you. It is uh, to be expected that several professional football clubs will challenge uh, this decision of our Dutch FA. Uh, and they are preparing and initiating legal proceedings before the Dutch civil courts at the moment. Uh, not only the clubs that did not promote to a higher league, uh, but also, for example, uh, FC Utrecht, one of our uh, clubs in the Netherlands, that is not appointed by the Dutch FA to be provided with a ticket for the UEFA Europa League. Uh, FC Utrecht, for example, mainly finds that it is entitled to be admitted as one of the Dutch clubs for the Euro Europa League, also because FC Utrecht was in the final for the Dutch FA Cup which did not take place. Um, the Dutch FA Cup was left aside and no winner was called out for this uh, tournament. Um, as a final introductory note, and as I said before, there is no football in the Netherlands until the 1st of September. Uh, and however, I don't think it is ruled out that matches after 1 September, if any, will, uh, I think, will take place without fans first. Uh, so, but we will have to, to wait for this, uh, obviously. If I take a look at the force majeure under uh, Dutch law, um, we also know this concept and uh, an appeal, for example, on this force majeure concept requires the impediment, the, uh, an impossibility of compliance with a contractual obligation. And this is the case, for example, when performance is entirely um, or partially impossible. And um, an ex successful appeal, for example, on this force majeure under Dutch law requires that the non-performance is not uh, attributable to the debtor, which is a very important uh, part uh, here under Dutch law. And at the end of the day, um, successfully invoking force majeure under Dutch law uh, without specific contractual arrangements uh, really depends on the specific circumstance of the case and is a very difficult path uh, under Dutch law. If I take a look at the government support at the moment, uh, on 18 March last, the Dutch government officially introduced the so-called, and they, they call it the Noodmaatregel Overbrugging Werkgelegenheid, uh, also translated as the Emergency Bridging Measure for Sustained Employment, also referred to as the NAU. Uh, and the NAU makes it possible to financially support Dutch employers and to compensate them uh, for their ongoing labor costs for their employees and reduce turnover due to the COVID-19 outbreak. And the now applies to companies of all sizes, including Dutch employers in the sports sector, uh, also football. So therefore it is possible for our Dutch clubs, football clubs, um, to intend to submit a now application uh, or will submit such an application in the near future. However, we have uh, some conditions to qualify for such a now contribution for the Dutch professional football clubs towards their labor costs. They have to meet uh, certain conditions, for example, a commitment in advance not to dismiss any employees for reasons of business economics. Uh, and for example, also that the club expects at least 20% loss of the turnover. If the football clubs meet these conditions, uh, the club will receive a contribution towards the wage costs of a maximum of 90% of the wage. However, it is also important to stress that a condition of the now contribution will only be granted if the Dutch employer declares to continue to pay 100% of the wages of the employees. So if club wants to apply for this, clubs uh, have to pay their coaches and players the full 100%. Um, if we take a look at the current situation in the Netherlands regarding salaries um, so far, and specifically looking to the player and coaches contracts, uh, until today, there's not a single Dutch football club that decided to reduce the salary of its players and or coaches. So far, all players, all coaches received 100% of their salary. Uh, it must be taken into account in this regard also that under Dutch law, uh, Dutch law does not provide for salary reducements very easily. Under Dutch law, a salary reducement can only take place in case the employer and the employee mutually agree on this, obviously, or if the employment contract explicitly provides for this, or in case existence of unforeseen circumstances that require any amendment to the contract.
However, since it is officially decided that the Dutch competition will not be continued, as was decided uh, very recently, last Friday, as I told you before, and no matches can take place until at least 1 September, the Dutch professional football clubs will now face more difficult difficulties. Um, it is to be expected that clubs will now enter into negotiations with their players and coaches in order to discuss any salary reducements due to the current situation we're in. And for example, at this moment, only PSV Eindhoven uh, has entered into negotiations with its employees to discuss reducements. And PSV, for example, is thinking of a salary decrease of 20% for the bigger contracts and less than 20% for the smaller contracts. Um, we also see at the moment that there are a lot of contracts that are not extended or extended based on other conditions. Um, which I think is also important to mention is that in the Netherlands we have both the coaches and the professional players have their own collective bargaining agreement. Uh, and at this moment the stakeholders have come together, the players union and the employers organization for professional football, they come together and now discuss possible solutions with regard to salary reducements uh, for the employees as well as for, for any other contractual issues. Um, with regard to resuming training, that's also a hot topic at the moment. Um, last Friday, uh, during the conference call uh, between the, the Dutch FA and the professional football clubs, it was also decided that the clubs can start with individual training sessions um, uh, at short notice, but only for their A squad uh, players. However, the exact conditions are not clear yet. Um, there will be uh, guidelines, so so-called protocol will be issued with regard to safety hygiene and also from an organizational point of view uh, but we still have to wait for this um, well this was my my presentation so far and i hope you you learned a bit more uh, and informed you a bit more about the effects the COVID outbreak uh, has at dutch level uh, and as i said before until now the current contracts of the players and coach are not heavily affected due to the COVID outbreak yet uh, but since it is decided that there will be no football in the netherlands until the first of september we expect more and more difficulties and there will be more discussions between the players unions and the uh, uh, employers organizations to discuss the possibility of salary reducements. I do think, to be honest, that clubs, players and coaches will come to mutual agreements on this aspect, uh, but we have to wait and see for this. Thank you for, uh, for this. Thank you, Franz. Thank you very much. So I give the floor to Juan de Dios Crespo. He will explain the situation in Spain. Juan, you have the floor. Don't forget your micro. I was Could be pity. Yes. Muted by, by Ronald. You know that I don't like to be muted, but here I am. I was saying that uh, thank you very much uh, to Aya for this idea, uh, Ronald, Patricia. Um, where are we in Spain? We don't know. I mean, friends, right now has just changed. Uh, we don't know, according to France, uh, what's going on or what will be going on with the uh, with, uh, Netherlands, but for the, the end of the competition only. So, uh, Spain on the 12th, I don't remember, but 12th of March, the, the Spanish league decided to stop the competition, professional, and I think that on the 11th of March, uh, the non-professional competition in football by the Spanish FA were decided to. And only a few days after, on the 14th, the government decided to uh, do what we call the state of alarm, which is uh, nothing but to stay at home and to, to work at home, but for the most important of the, of the works, uh, the jobs uh, like doctors, police, etc. So we are confined since that time and sports to be confined and football too. So to be uh, quick on that, we have a legal weapon and we have a non-legal weapon as always, uh, or it seems that it's the same in France. The, the legal weapon that we have is called ERTE, Temporary Employment Regulation Process, which is my translation, but it's more or less the same, I think uh, in Spanish, ERTE. So you, you suspend the contract and you you go you send your 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 players players or employees I mean it's not only for football players it's for any uh, company and any employee employer relationship so you, you suspend and you send to the unemployment 
all those guys. So, and the first question I, I, I received from one of my clients, uh, if I am taking 3 million per year, is the state going to pay me my unemployment on that basis? No, no, not at all. So what we have here is that when you do this RT, uh, this uh, uh, temporary employment uh, regulation, which is a reduction of, uh, of the salary and the sending to the, to the unemployment system, it has to be asked first, requested, then approved or not. In the case of football teams, all of them have been approved, but other companies or the um, employment uh, uh, relationship have not been approved. Why? Because you need to have a clear impossibility to do your job. So in football, it's clear that it's forbidden to, to play, it's forbidden to train, forbidden to do anything. So all of them have been approved you are going to get 70% on a minimum amount, which is a mandatory minimum. I, I'm not going to explain what is the minimum or not, but just for the sake of clarity, it would be around 1,100 to 1,400 more or less. And from that amount, the state will pay 70%. So the clubs are only, only saving 30% on those amounts, which is nothing. But anyway, even though it is nothing, the clubs that have decided to do and to go by, by this ERTE, the Temporary Employment Regulation, or Barcelona, so a big club, Atletico Madrid, a big club, Espanol, Alaves and Asuna, five in the first division, 10 in the second division, and 40 in the third division. And as for women football, five out of uh, 16 teams have decided to go to this ERTE. So it's not a majority of course, and then what else? What do we have? What do we have? We have the possibility to uh, agree. And as I think it was uh, uh, France, we said that is, is not uh, a new contract, is not, uh, is an amendment or an annex to the contract. An amendment or annex. And then you have all and every possibilities like the 1001 nights. Uh, you know, everyone is different and marvelous. So here you don't have 1,001 club, but you have a lot of possibilities. For instance, I'm not going to name clubs because uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, has to be uh, private because of private agreements. In one club, a big club, depending on if the competition is going to resume or not, the amount will be less or higher. Just the example of a club. If there's no new competition or not resuming, the competition is not resuming, you're gonna have 20% of reduction on the real salary. I mean, if you have 10 millions, it will be 20% of the 10 millions. Then if the competition is uh, resuming without spectators, it will be 10% and so on. In other clubs, in other clubs uh, that have been involved into, they were not so, so strong, so tough in, in, in trying to reduce and uh, it could be 1% only a club of first division, it depends on, on who is the owner. So, you know, if you, uh, an owner is the owner of the club and uh, he wants to keep uh, um, a nice relationship with the players, then he will have a lesser reduction. And you have, as I said, a lot from 40% to 1%. No one has said nil, but to 1%. And it depends on if you resume, if you resume with spectators or resume with without spectators. So those are the three possibilities and there are a lot, as I said, of percentages. So what are we going to do right now? Some clubs are just waiting and seeing. Some clubs have not yet decided, but after what I've been, uh, I heard from Patricia and uh, the France is, is just uh, ending the competition. What's going to be with Spain? Spain is, is looking up to the, to the other big leagues, uh, England, Premier League, Germany, Bundesliga, France, and Italy. And I think that after the example of France, it will be difficult for others to, to follow uh, another uh, path and to go through uh, a, a competition to be resumed. It's, it will be difficult. It's, how can you explain that in one big country of a bigger uh, uh, league like France, it, it's impossible? And in others like in Spain, if for instance in Spain, some players have said that they don't want to play, they don't want to train, anymore. So up till 
let's say September, I don't know if September or October or, or December, we don't know. Each day we have a daily basis change on that. So you have to pick what you want or you pick to go to the ERTE, so this temporary employment regulation and you go on unemployment and you are paid a small salary, but of course the club must pay the rest of the salaries. So if you have 3 million, you are going to get only on that small amount of 1,000, you're going to get 700 and something, to 70% paid by the state, and the rest has to be paid by the club. So I, in my opinion, I don't know why the clubs are doing that. Because it's much better for them to agree. Because an agreement on 20 or 10% even in the salary, in the gross salary, is much better, is much higher. The, 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 the remedy is much, is much better for them than to go to the earth day. And I don't know how and why they have decided to, to go that way. If it was 70% of the whole contract, I would have understood. But come on, 70% of 1,089 euros? You know, I'm sure that in some clubs, the third division clubs, the fourth division club, they might be interesting. But the first division club, Atletico Madrid, Real Madrid, are they really joking or not? I mean, it's not, it's not a, a, an issue for me. Maybe they just did that because they wanted to show that the other part of football, non-sporting, so no players, no coaches, were also going to have uh, this uh, LT. But frankly speaking, it's, a, it's a quite a nonsense. Uh, I would prefer, and that's why I'm advising my clubs to, or my clients to, to, uh, to reach agreements. On the agreements, has been asked by some players, should I sign the agreement or not? It is mandatory signing agreement or not? Of course it's not. And uh, one of uh, a big player of a big club told me, Juan, I'm going to sign anyway. Even though you are advising me not to sign because the other are going to sign. I don't want to be the black sheep there. I want to be as all of them, as all my teammates, but it's not mandatory. It has to be agreed by all individuals one by one. And the contracts and the amendment of the contracts and the annex of the contracts are all like that. Mr. Y is signing to the club this agreement, this annex to the, to the contract. So it's not a uh, mandatory, it's not a, a duty to, to follow your, your teammates. But of course, if you don't follow them, you might be treated differently when you come, when it's coming back. And uh, now we are in April. The RT is a temporary, so what are going to be, if it's not that temporary, if we are following exactly what French is doing, if everything is resuming or not resuming or starting again or starting anew in the first of, of, this, of September, or maybe in January next year, are we going to have those RT? I think that the clubs are going to change their mind because they thought when they were asking for this RT, for this temporary employment regulation, they were thinking about one month, month and a half, and that's all. But if it's going to be eight months, seven, eight months, they, they, they won't take anything. I mean, uh, the, the clubs that have signed agreement with the reduction of players, they were much better positioned economically. So I think that uh, we might have changes now. And after an RT has been uh, decided and approved, maybe some clubs are going to, to change their mind. And after the end of this temporary agreement, this temporary uh, employment regulation, they might come back and try to have an agreement. It is said, it is said that Barcelona is trying to do both. It's trying to do an agreement, collective agreement with all the players, and at the meantime, they have done the RT. So this is what we have right now in Spain. And uh, try to be quick because my predecessors have all of them used all most of the time. And this is the ball that is right now confined and is not going to be played, I guess, until the end of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan, for your explanation and your humor, too. Um, Joachim, it's your turn. Can you explain what is going on in Germany, please? Yes, thanks, Patricia. Good evening to everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, first of all, I want to shortly address the current situation in German football. We had our last Bundesliga match on March 11. It has already been executed without spectators because it was a postponed match. And uh, 
the amazing fact about it was that there have been about 10,000 spectators uh, before the stadium. Maybe Patricia, you will remember PSG against Borussia. It was quite the same. And that is something that uh, needs to be taken into account when we take a decision whether or not we can reassume uh, the competition. Um, currently, uh, the government plans to release a statement whether or not uh, the season can be continued May 6th. And the German League already prepared a 41 pages paper uh, that exactly describes the security requirements and how many people may attend the stadium and so on. And everybody hopes uh, that the league can be continued. Um, currently, there's a prohibition of big events until August 31. So for sure, if there are any matches, they can only be held without spectators. But, uh, and I'm surprised that nobody of the other speakers uh, I've mentioned that so far it's very crucial for, for the league and the clubs that these uh, uh, matches can take place. Why? Because uh, at least in Germany, the biggest part of financing clubs consists in TV money. And if the fourth installment for the last nine matches is not uh, paid by the TV uh, stations, um, there are rumors that about one third of the German clubs, which usually are quite healthy in an economic matter, um, may be bankrupt. And so it's very crucial to make sure that the season can by any means uh, be completed, even though at the moment uh, it's not sure yet that this will work. And I'm afraid that France uh, may be an example for the German government to reconsider the, the tendency that so far is positive. But on the other side, one must also take into account the following aspects. Uh, if the infection rate will grow, it's likely that the competition, once it has been started, will be stopped again. If uh, a situation occurs again, like in, in that match that I mentioned, that thousands of spectators gather around the stadium, that is obviously not the purpose of the match without spectators, then I'm pretty sure that the season will also be stopped again. Or if team starts playing and uh, players are getting infected or whole teams have to be quarantined again, then they will also have to, to stop the competition because obviously then there's no equality of competition anymore if a whole team has to be taken out of the competition for weeks at least. So that is the current situation um, of football now and can't speak to the legal situation. Um, actually, we have no laws uh, in Germany that specifically deal with that situation, nor do we have any CBAs. And the German league, uh, also based on that uncertainty at the moment that I mentioned, did not uh, enact any guidelines of FIFA yet. So we're still waiting, for example, about a rule, how long the season will take uh, if it's continued at all. So that is still quite uncertain at the moment. Um, actually, uh, players were sent home in the middle of March and uh, did individual training then. So far, they have been paid. Uh, we also have this uh, law about partial activity, but there's uh, beneath the cap that is in Germany, 60% out of 6,900 euros gross, or depending on the number of children, the player ha has maybe up to 67%. But obviously, as Juan said for Spain and Patricia uh, for France, um, this does not help too much because uh, if the government refunds a maximum of 4,500 euros, for example, and the player has like uh, 200,000 per month, then it's not of too much use for the clubs. And even more important, uh, this law is only applicable if there's a legal basis for it. And this legal basis must be in the employment contracts or in the CBA and both of, us, uh, both of them are not existing. So. We can only send the players to this uh, partial activity if the players agree and they will only agree if the club promises to, to gross up the balance. And then, as Juan explained for Spain, it doesn't make too much sense anymore because what the club save is not too much. We do not have any law that would allow to suspend uh, the payment of the player or automatically reduce the salary. Um, there are some voices in the legal doctrine that say once an employer is shortly before insolvency, he may be entitled to reduce the salary, but it, that is something very uncertain and I wouldn't go to court with that. And uh, I think in that situation, employers rather run a risk uh, that it might be considered to be a breach of contract if they reduce or completely retain the salary. 
Um, therefore, most clubs, or in the meantime, I assume you know, all in the first and second league, started to enter into negotiations with the teams. And on average, I would say that teams waived uh, like 20% of uh, the basic salary. Sometimes it was an unconditional waiver. Sometimes it was a waiver subject to conditions like if they retain the first league or if they qualify for the Champions League. And sometimes they only deferred the matu maturity of payments, making it dependent on whether or not the fourth installment of the TV money will be paid. And um, well, another issue we are currently di discussing, and that is what FIFA apparently also addresses uh, in the guidelines, is uh, when will the end of the season be? Who, who fixes it? What is the international dimension of it? And there are many discussions because, of course, we, we read what FIFA says that they say in questions of doubt that the season uh, must be extended until it's completed, if it's completed at all. But according to German law, it's a problem because if the contract says uh, it expires on June 30, it's very difficult to interpret it in a way like June 30 means July 31st or August 31st or whatever. Um, because there's also a formal requirement that any contract that is limited in time must be in written and the limitation must be in written. So the question is how can June 30 mean in written that it's July 31st? And that is why if the uh, season must be extended or can be extended, one must better say, uh, in that case, uh, it's recommendable that clubs and players enter into supplementary agreements and explicitly agree uh, to extend the contract uh, for a certain time, which of course raises further problems, which I don't want to address because it's not our issue, but just to give you an example. For example, if the contract so far says um, the, the salary will be 10,000 more next season, um, or starting from July 1st better. Um, does this apply in this specific situation where July 1st is not the new season, but it's just an extension of the old season? So there are many uh, subsequent problems linked to this extension of the season, if it happens, which we all hope, but uh, of course cannot say for sure. Um, that was briefly summarized the situation in Germany. Thanks. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you very much. Uh, Stefano Laporta uh, is going to explain us what is going on in Italy. Stefano, you have the floor. Thank you, Patricia, and uh, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, the situation in Italy is uh, quite tricky at the moment because all sports activities at the moment are suspended, prohibited. Uh, by a decree from the government and uh, a new decree was enacted a few days ago uh, making it, uh, it possible only for individual sports to start again with training sessions uh, starting on May the 4th. Uh, so this means that football is not included in this list of course and uh, during a uh, public uh, statement the Prime Minister anticipated that sports, uh, team sports such as football should start again training sessions on May the 18th but uh, frankly speaking uh, the decree doesn't say anything at this regard so at the moment May the 18th is still uh, something to be confirmed and of course uh, this was uh, received uh, with disappointment by the football family because everyone was looking forward to start over again with training sessions in the middle of May and this date has an important value and meaning because uh, in order to complete the, comp the professional competitions by the uh, beginning of August because the Italian FA said that the season would tentatively end on August the 2nd. It is, uh, uh, let's say, essential to start playing official games in the middle of June. It's a matter of calendar. Otherwise, it is not possible to complete the season. Uh, what about the Italian FA? The Italian FA uh, has been waiting for some decisions from the government like all other sports federations. Uh, and meanwhile, the Italian FA has drawn up a medical protocol in order to set up some uh, best practices 
and uh, in some cases some requirements in order for football activities be um, practiced uh, with the utmost level of uh, safety for all participants. And these measures include uh, uh, isolated training camps, uh, the screening and uh, testing of both uh, players and staff members, and also specific uh, uh, sanitizing of equipment and uh, working places. Uh, at, frankly speaking, also this protocol has been subject to criticism because uh, many uh, medical uh, staff members of clubs have raised some doubts, concerns, uh, and the reason why is very easy to understand because uh, uh, the medical staff will be directly responsible and liable in case something happens to their athletes. And so eventually it will be them to bear the responsibility of uh, allowing there are their own employees to play football, both on the training grounds and uh, during official games. And I agree with the Juan that after the decision that was taken by France today, it will be even more complicated for other, let's call them major leagues of Europe to take the responsibility to start over again the competitions, but we will wait and see. What about players' contacts? That is the focus of this uh, uh, sharing of information and discussion. Uh, in Italy, we don't have any collective measures adopted yet. We don't have any specific provisions in the collective bargaining agreements addressing such a force majeure uh, occurrence. Uh, we don't have any insurances or, me or mechanism in place to somehow uh, limit the damages that for sure the virus is causing to the whole football family. And the football family is waiting for, is still waiting for some help and guidance from the Italian government. And this is, uh, this uh, is happening uh, since the start of the, let's say, the emergency situation we are living in. But still, again, we are waiting for something to be decided. We've had uh, several meetings between the players' union and the professional leagues in order to find some general guidance, some general compromise and, uh, between the interests of players and of clubs. Uh, the major league, the Serie A league, proposed a cut of the salaries to the players' union, but the players' union has rejected such a proposal. And meanwhile, some clubs, including Juventus and AS Roma, have found agreements with their players, providing for a reduction of salaries both clubs agreed on a four-month reduction of salaries subject to several con conditions and subject to several uh, possible development of the situation, meaning that if the, the competition, the Serie A, starts again and resumes, parts of those salaries will be paid. Some others may be paid in the upcoming seasons. But everything, of course, is subject to the final outcome of the, the suspension. If the suspension is final, there is something going on. Otherwise, uh, the situation may change. What are the discussions with other leagues? Uh, we know that the third division has nearly found an agreement with the players' union, while all others are still uh, under discussions. What kind of remedies can be used according to civil law, to Italian civil law, to face this emergency situation. We have some clause in our civil code uh, addressing a hypothesis that can be 
compared to the uh, common law hardship. Because of course, this is a, a typical case when the performance of the obligation of the one party has become excessively difficult or ex excessively or not possible to, let's say, to fulfill. Uh, the problem about this provision under Italian law is that the hardship cannot bring directly to the reduction of the salary, but can only be uh, used to ask for the termination of the contract. That, of course, the termination of contract for um, football clubs uh, is the, not even an extrema ratio, not even a last resort, but for many of them, is uh, something that they don't want to even think about. And uh, turning back to this hardship uh, concept, uh, if the club asks for the termination, the player can ask for a reduction of the, the consideration agreed upon. But the, the reduction of the salary cannot be directly asked for by the club, but again, it's something that can only be asked for by players in order to avoid the termination. So this is a tricky mechanism that uh, likely it will be difficult to, to enforce in this case. I believe, just to conclude my intervention, that the general principle of good faith should intervene in this case uh, to lead players and clubs and all people involved in this uh, unique situation, luckily, because it's the first time that we have to face uh, such a scenario. They, uh, good faith should uh, be the cornerstone to help all parties to find a suitable agreement to make the system still be sustainable and uh, I keep going on. Otherwise, I see the litigation may be massive and uh, also in, in terms of timing, very, very difficult to be solved uh, in a reasonable time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefano. I give the floor to Carol. Carol, he is here to explain us and to give her overview about the situation in UK. Carol, do you have the floor? You have to put on your micro first. We can hear you. Yeah, that's great. You can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, so in the UK, we've been in lockdown since the 23rd of March. Uh, this position is due to be reviewed on the 7th of May. Um, professional football was actually ahead of the curve on this and has been suspended since mid-March. But the EFL and the Premier League clubs have stressed that they're committed to completing seasons. Um, and in this fast-moving situation, the Premier League uh, announced yesterday uh, that they're actually considering a return to the competitive game on the 8th of June. Uh, to conclude the season by the end of July and play the remaining 92 games. Uh, EFL had um, recommended a return to training no sooner than mid-May, but perhaps that, that will change. Um, numerous Premier League clubs have already returned to training today and, and yesterday. This is on a, an individual socially distanced basis, on a rotor basis. They're just using the, the outside facilities and, and you know, returning immediately after that. But foreign players of some clubs have been asked to return to their clubs by next Tuesday. So it'd be interesting to see uh, whether any of these players refuse to return. Obviously, there are contractual, uh, contractual obligations on players to train and play. But clearly, uh, an employee is also protected under national law if they have genuine concerns regarding health and safety of the workplace. Um, if they do return, will they be quarantined, given their potential exposure on um, a, uh, an international flight, or will private jets you know, be able to mitigate this risk? Obviously, if competition does resume, it's going to be behind closed doors. Um, that said, 
Premier League clubs have estimated that even then they'll be in the region of 300 people who will be in attendance, um, you know, on the basis of the squads, backroom staff, medical teams and reporters. So everything will have to be in accordance with public health um, guidance, including regular private testing of squads and assurance regarding uh, no congregation of fans around um, stadiums. But it is to be noted, it's, it's different, um, you know, compared to the situations in other countries, but the government does seem to be behind the um, resumption of competition um, while safeguarding um, the the safety of those in, involved, but they believe that it's going to be crucial to boost um, public morale. Uh, so on Friday, the Premier League is going to consider the logistics for return. So there's been talk of sanitising balls, pitches, uh, individual labelled drinks, um, players maybe training in face masks. Uh, there's also been speculation about the possibility of uh, neutral venues and um, perhaps as well, the possibility of some matches being streamed or offered on a free-to-air basis, given that there's non-attendance of fans at, at matches. And um, so just a, a nod to Scotland as well, in comparison, um, the situation is, is a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, the SPFL had voted to call off the second, third and fourth divisions, uh, allowing prize money to be distributed um, based on a, a points per game basis. And there was also a mandate given to end the championship if, um, if it couldn't be completed. But there's been doubts raised over the legitimacy of the voting process. So now there's going to be uh, an EGM uh, on the 12th of May to consider calls for uh, an external investigation into, into the process. Um, with regard to finances, clearly, you know, as with any business, if football's unable to carry on its business, um, it's going to have serious cash considerations, concerns. Uh, the Premier League ca calculated at the outset that in the event of a worst case scenario and that the league couldn't be completed, um, they would lose in the region of £760 million in broadcast revenue that need to be repaid to broadcasters. Um, again, as I stress, it's a worst case scenario. Um, but on, on that premise, they said that um, they would look to players to take a 30% pay cut to help address this issue in this worst case scenario. Um, matters have developed since then and I'll come on to that shortly. Um, but it is just worth noting that if the season does resume behind closed doors, um, lower down the leagues where we don't have the benefit of, of broadcast revenues, it's actually um, going to cost clubs money to stage these games. Um, you know, there is, they're not able to offset these costs against uh, gate receipts. So what are the options for clubs, players and managers? There's been a lot of talk about force majeure, but this is a civil law concept rather than a common law doctrine. So it's only applicable if the parties provide for it contractually. The standard Premier League and EFL contracts don't include that in uh, the, the contracts. So notwithstanding um, you know, FIFA's consideration that this is a uh, force majeure, at national level, this doesn't affect the employment relationship. But slightly differently in uh, Scotland, the SPFL contract does provide for a possible suspension of uh, the standard playing contract in the event that the SFA suspends games. Um, but we've seen that clubs tend to be looking to vary their contracts on a consensual basis rather than unilaterally, perhaps, you know, acknowledging that, that, that there's a risk of, of litigation if if that clause were was sought to be relied upon. Uh, so with state aid, I know there's been a various talk of that. In uh, March the 20th, UK government introduced the coronavirus job retention scheme, and the intention was to prevent mass redundancies and, and protect the economy at an estimated cost of £42 billion um, and introduced the concept of furloughing staff. So this allows employers to retain and pay staff without requiring them to work and effectively businesses request the state to pay 80% of a member of staff's monthly salary up to a maximum of £2,500. An employer can top up wages if it's willing to and it covers commissions built into an employment, employer's employee's salary, but not discretionary payments like bonuses. 
the scheme uh, is currently available until the end of June. Um, and whilst a furlough is in place, all employment rights remain unaffected. A guidance suggests that furloughing requires the, should have the consent of, of the employee. Um, the guidance also provides that it allows for job related training, but not, not working. And um, provided this training doesn't involve providing services to or generating revenue for or on behalf of the employer. So this requires careful consideration, obviously, in the context of, of footballers training. So actually, if we consider the scheme in the context of football, I mean, if it's not going to be applicable really to, to playing staff at, at the highest level. Um, but the likes of Sunderland and Crew have furloughed all players and staff, as have numerous uh, Scottish clubs. Five Premier League clubs announced that they wanted to use the furloughing scheme for non-playing staff, but there was um, sort of public outcry really at perceived very wealthy clubs uh, looking to the state to, to fund their business. And now um, Liverpool Spurs and Bournemouth have reversed their, their decisions to use furloughing and it's just Newcastle and Norwich that have furloughed non-playing staff but they're, they're topping up wages. So really what we're seeing on the whole is a reduction or deferral of salary on a consensual basis. Uh, the PFA is acting on behalf of its members in negotiation with Premier League and EFL clubs on a club by club basis. As I mentioned before, there was this talk of a 30% um, pay cut it, obviously in the event of this worst case scenario of the competition not going ahead um, but this a global settlement wasn't possible on this um, and we've gone to a, a club by club negotiation so effectively from a club's perspective you know there's serious cash flow considerations ultimately at a Premier League level uh, the wage to turnover ratios in the region of 60% but the lower down the leagues you get so certainly the championship um, that ratio, the wage ratio is significantly higher and obviously where there's no broadcasting revenue coming in, there's nothing to compensate that. And so there are genuinely clubs that, that could go out of business if there's no income coming in in the next few, few months. From a player's perspective though, clearly they're going to be saying, you know, this is through no fault of their own, uh, their, their careers are relatively short, the onus is on the clubs to demonstrate a genuine financial hardship and so we're getting accountancy input uh, at that level in order to to really drill down to the club's financial position um, so key terms really to be considered are we talking about a cut a few clubs that have made cuts or deferrals if it's a deferral for how long what are the terms of the repayment and what's the security what happens if a deferral is agreed, but then that club goes out of business in the interim. Well, under the football rules, uh, clubs, sorry, players and managers would be considered to be football creditors. So they would have a preferential standing to be repaid ahead of the likes of the tax authorities in the case of, uh, of administration. But what we're seeing on the ground really is, is sort of practical measures being taken for, for players to safeguard any deferrals Things like transfer embargoes, the clubs can't go in, out into the transfer and um, out into the marketplace unless they've repaid uh, the, the players. So we've seen the likes of um, Southampton, Aston Villa, West Ham agreeing uh, wage deferrals. Arsenal players have agreed a 12.5% wage cut um, for a year, subject to performance incentives. Um, and across the, the Scottish um, clubs, there's a huge disparity ranging from uh, reliance on the furloughing, pay cuts and, and deferrals. Uh, and just finally, really, um, to mention that uh, what is the impact on those players that have contracts um, that, that are up to uh, the 30th of June, as um, Joaquin mentioned, um, you know, notwithstanding FIFA's position of extending contracts, ultimately, um, if under national law, unless there's agreement of the parties, in those scenarios, there's not going to be an extension. So we'll see outside of the Premier League, a thousand players approximately out of contract as of the 30th of June. And um, the standard um, contract, playing contract, does provide for severance pay 
at the end of a fixed term contract one month so it eases the financial burden slightly but clearly if, if you know the transfer window is not going to be open um as of first of july then then it's going to cause these players issues but i appreciate that's a point to be considered uh, another seminar thank you thank you carol for this uh, very interesting explanation about the situation in uh, your country and in Scotland. Uh, I give the floor to Pedro Massineira. I hope I pronounce correctly your name, Pedro. You have the floor to explain Thank the you, Patricia. situation not, in Portugal. Thank you, Patricia. It's not correct, it's Massirinha, but uh, it's almost correct, uh, no problem. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to explain the case in Portugal. It's not many different from the case in France and in, in Spain, for what I listened for the last uh, for you and, and from Juan. Uh, in the beginning, uh, in one month ago, we have the topic and the focus on the discussion of the impact of this, uh, the, the measures that the, the COVID brings to the contract. Now everybody is with the focus on uh, understanding if the, the, the championship will restart or not. Uh, but at that, the first point, uh, we have um, with the, the, the first measure declar declaration from, from FIFA, uh, everybody is still uh, and find in the, our labor, core and the labor code uh, the mechanism of the layoff that it was a, a very uh, complicated system. Uh, then the, the government make a rule, like you said in France, that simplified this layoff and all the, 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 the discussion started if uh, the clubs can apply or not to this layoff. Uh, in the beginning, the, the players' unions tried to fight this, uh, this uh, the clubs go to the layoff and try to uh, with uh, in uh, uh, in the guide with the, the guidelines of FIFA to to create a movement with the clubs to start to negotiate a, a, a collective a, a agreement between the teams uh, so the they the, the, to avoid the clubs to go to the to the to the layoff uh, in the in the beginning. Uh, um, uh, we have the problem with uh, not only the problem with the question about the salaries of the players, uh, they start another question about the question of the holidays of the players because the, everybody think in the beginning that the, the, the championship will restart in June, that is the normally the, the month of the holidays of the players. So uh, the clubs start to see how they can avoid to. Uh, put players playing in the month of the holidays and they don't pay them the, the indemnity that is pre uh, previewed in the, in the labor court code uh, if they don't uh, allow the players to uh, enjoy their holidays. So uh, most of the clubs start to see all these these facts and and seem that the, it's better not to impose the players the question about layoff because if they impose the layoff. As, as in France, they, can, they, they don't need the agreement of the player to, to go to the layoff. Um, but they really face a problem because they don't have the, the, then the possibility to negotiate with the players the question about the holidays and putting all the, the, the things in, in, the, in, the, in equation, uh, they, they realize that it's better to start the phase of the, the, the negotiation of contract and try to make a contract where they uh, simplify all these this, uh, this, uh, uh, issues. So most of the teams from the first league, they go uh, to the to, to agreement, they defer all the salaries, um, at one 40%, another 30%, that they uh, agree to give to the players when the, 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 player, the, the season restarts. Uh, or in the next season, a uh, part in the next season, and uh, they agree with the players to uh, change the, cha the, the, the holiday period to, to, to March, uh, and then uh, they don't have to pay them if they play, yet to play in June. Uh, others, uh, other preoccupation that the clubs have is that the question about the extension of the contract, and they try to put this on the agreement too. Because as uh, someone already talked uh, in this webinar, 
We have the, the contracts that terminate in 3rd of June. Uh, if the, we, we miss 10, 10 games to finish the, the championship, if, if it starts in June, of course, they have to go after, after June, so to July. And some of the teams risk that they don't have players uh, because the contracts terminate in 30 of, of June. So on this agreement, they try to, to say to the players, OK, we make a deferral of the salary now, but we give you the money uh, in, if, the play, if the championship restarts or in the next season, but you have to extend the contract until the last game of the, of the championship, whenever he, he can, or and uh, you have to assign that you, you, make, you, you enjoy your holidays in March or in April in this period that you have um, in your home uh, because of the, the restrictions that we have from the emergency state of the, the law of the emergency state. So uh, this is the main issue in, in, uh, in April. Uh, now I think it's all solved. Uh, all teams uh, try to solve with the players, and uh, I think that uh, you have no no great issues on on this. Some of the most uh, little teams they go to the layoff, and they have these problems that they have to face uh, if the, the, the championship restarts or not. At, the, at this point, uh, the question now is uh, concentrate in in see if the the, we have a competition or not. Uh, we have a lot of problems because of this, because of the question of, uh, of the, the, the health. Uh, uh, they have to, at this point, we cannot use the, the stadiums to, 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 to train. Some of teams are uh, back to the academies and start training in the difficult situations with uh, measures from the, the health department uh, in groups of four. Uh, the, the distance by 20 meters, each other of uh, each player from each other, uh, and uh, they are getting back on this situation. We face another problem because we have, uh, as you know, two autonomic reg regions that have uh, different uh, laws from the, 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 the mainland, from the continent. And uh, in this case, for instance, uh, we have from Azores uh, a, a law that say that uh, every uh, people that lands in, in Azores have to make a, a 15 uh, or mandatory quarantine in a, in a hotel. So uh, imagine that if they restart the competition, how they will do it when a team fly to Azores to, to play, they have to go 15 days early and stay uh, practicing in the hotel, uh, in, the, in the room, so they, they can perform. Or even if the, if the team come to the mainland and then when return, they cannot go to practice as the other team. So we have this, all these uh, issues that we really don't know how to deal with uh, and what is the, the decision that, that, that will, will uh, be, be assumed by, by the league and by the government. Uh, we believe that uh, it, maybe it is possible to restart the competition. It's very difficult. We live with 90% of the recipes of the clubs here is from the TV rights. We have already the guys from the TV rights saying that no game, no money. So we have faced a lot of problems. We know that if the, 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 the championship restart and we have to prolong the contracts one more uh, one more uh, month, uh, it's more expensive for the clubs too. Uh, we have uh, facing or dealing with uh, games without the spectators, so with less recipes too. Uh, and uh, it's uh, really uh, confused to, to understand how this uh, will be uh, dealt in, 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 the, in, uh, in, um, in the end. One last point to say that uh, when this this always this this uh, issue begins about the salaries of the players. All the the, the presidents of the clubs uh, they meet and they decide that uh, nobody is allowed to contract players that uh, terminate their contract because of the COVID uh, cuts. Uh, so if uh, they they decide by themselves in. Uh, in an economical way, or in a pressure way, to, to put on the players that nobody from the league are allowed to contract 
uh, the players that will terminate their contract because of this question about the, the COVID and the cuts that they have to do it. So they make a, a pressure on the players in the beginning. So they accept the cuts and don't discuss this uh, in, uh, at the present. Of course, on the present, nobody is discussing this, but we believe that we face a lot of litigation uh, as soon as this uh, ends and everybody will claim for these rights. So we face a lot of problems in the next season for sure. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much. Um, Amin Oskurt, could you explain us what is going on in your country, in Turkey? You have the floor, Amin. Uh, don't your, your microphone? Yes. Is it? Yes, now? it's okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello, hello. Thank you, thank you Ronan, for plugging me in. Uh, before I start, I got something important to say. In times like this, nobody is right or wrong. So none of us has experienced anything like this, and therefore some of my legal assessments may be incomplete. So excuse me for that in advance. On the other hand, being the last speaker at an event is a challenging issue. Uh, as you know, some call it the graveyard shift. But luckily, since I'm from Turkey, and since my country, we have all sorts of supporting issues, legal matters arising from here, I think I will survive being the last speaker and make it work for those who listen to us here. I would like to start with summarizing the important milestones in Turkish football during this epidemic. On the 12th of March, Turkish Football Federation announced that leagues will be played without fans. Thereupon, one of the most important match of the season, Galatasaray Beşiktaş derby, was played behind closed doors without any spectators. And later on, on the 19th of March, Minister of Youth has announced that all of the leagues are postponed indefinitely. So this is the 14th day without football over here in Turkey. Also, the broadcaster, Bain Sports Company, announced that they are not going to pay the broadcasting right fees related to the month of March. Moreover, on the 13th of March, Turkish Union of Clubs made a statement and mentioned that the broadcaster should pay the clubs. At the very same statement, the clubs also mentioned that they have to, uh, they are going to cut the player salaries because of the financial damage. And finally, yesterday, the Turkish Professional Football uh, Players Association made a statement and stated that in accordance with FIFA's guiding principles, a players, football players, will not have to accept salary cut. But on the same day, Turkish Football League One Clubs Association issued a statement in response and stated that the clubs are facing bankruptcy risk and the players should accept the salary cuts. As you can see, there is a highly growing tension between the federation, clubs, players and the broadcaster company in Turkey. And if not a mutual understanding is reached between those parties, there will inevitably be big legal cases awaiting us. So let me go over the Turkish laws and regulations a little bit about the possible legal matters that may arise out of this pandemic. First off, let's have a look at uh, whether the football player contracts uh, will be automatically extended or not. In accordance with the uh, Article 19 of the Turkish Football Federation Professional Footballer Status and Transfer Regulation, the end date of a contract must be determined as the 31st of May. If the official competition continue after the end of that day, the contract period is deemed to be extended, extended until the end of the competitions. So this provision in Turkey is fully coordinated with FIFA, FIFA's guiding principles. On this respect, we can say that if the season is decided to be completed on a later date, the football players' contracts in Turkey will be automatically extended until the season ends. Secondly, let's have a look at the employment law-related regulations affecting players' contracts. With the amendment on the 17th of April, it has been foreseen that any employment or service contract 
cannot be terminated by the employer for three months, starting from the 17th of April, regardless of whether it is within the scope of the labor law by adding a temporary article to the Turkish labor law, they did that. In Turkish law, players' contracts are defined as service contracts under the law of obligations. So the contracts of the coaches and the staff are described as, as the employment contract. There's a difference in between them. Therefore, with the new amendment, the termination of players, coaches, and staff contracts are also prohibited for three months. The clubs will not be uh, eligible to terminate contracts for the players and staff during this three months period. Also, the regulation mentioned above uh, clearly provides some kind of a protection for the employee, employers, employees. Another important question is that whether this COVID-19 is seen as a force majeure in the context of the football contracts. As you are well aware of, and we have spoken about it here, in accordance with the guidelines explained by FIFA, COVID-19 was accepted as a force majeure. Again, according to FIFA's guidelines, unilateral decisions regarding changes in contracts will be accepted only when they are made in accordance with national laws where other collective engagements mechanisms allow. So if we examine the Turkish legislation under these circumstances, TFF did not define the concept of force majeure in its legislation and did not give, it play, give place to it. Also, according to the, to the given Supreme Court decisions, SARS epidemic, you remember SARS, it was a big epidemic as well. SARS epidemic was defined as a force majeure before. So according to Turkish law of obligations, in case of a force majeure party of a contract has two rights. It may be requested to adapt the contract according to the new conditions, in case where it is appropriate to reconstruct the risk sharing balance, or the debtor will request an adapt adaptation from the judge. But if it is not possible to adapt the contract, the debtor can exercise other rights. And the judge will investigate ex officio the concrete case. And if adaptation is possible, will freely determine the method and the amount. If it is not possible to adapt the contract, the right to return to terminate according to the nature of the contract can be used. If there is a contract that creates a continuous debt relationship between, between the parties, there will be a termination as stated in the last sentence of the Turkish law of obligations. Although it may seem possible to return from the contract with a non-court declaration, it will be the first institution to be considered by the judge when the dispute is brought to the court. And if the adaptation is possible, the return will be invalid. Guys, I see that one of the main topics is a very important one is the fate of the leagues. For me, uh, the two most important questions during this pandemic times is the health of the, uh, the health and the well-being of the players and the fate of the leagues. Few day, a few days ago, I have spoken to a good friend, David, David Dean, one of the football's most important figures, former co-owner and vice chairman of Arsenal, and now the ambassador for the Premier League. He asked me one very important question. Do the players really wish to play? Can you force them to play? I think it is a, this is a fair point. From the legal perspective, if your government defines your role as an essential, you may have to comply with your employer's wishes or risk termination. If you are performing an essential law, job, like a pharmacist, a police officer, a sanitation worker, your employer can say to you, you should come to work. But football, is football players job one of those essential ones? Also, only way that you can convince a footballer to go back on the pitch is by provi providing a certain health conditions for the league to proceed. For that purpose, guys, a month ago, a month ago, I have proposed quarantine league for completing the sporting season. The roadmap that I reckon was simple. Accommodate the teams at hotels at one city and survey them well, have them tested every week, play without spectators. 
although there seems to be three possibilities, cancellation, registration, and continuation regarding the fate of the leaks, quarantine leak, I believe that promises to minimize the upcoming legal wars and the economic collapse of the clubs with the completion of the league, unlike the other two possibilities. Scientifically, as also, uh, scientific verification also came from, uh, to my uh, proposal, uh, from the head of fight against coronavirus in the USA. I just uh, happened to watch Antonio Fauci, director of the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases about a couple of weeks ago, and he said that sporting competitions can be played if three requirements are met. No fun presence in stadiums, players being confined at a hotel, weekly tests on players. Thus com confirmed uh, the situation. So if the leagues are played and completed under the condi conditions of quarantine league, the contracts will continue with the minimum problem. Thus, players, clubs, broadcasters, sponsors will survive the COVID-19 period with minimum damage. And this is why, this is what I pro proposed a month ago and I still stand, uh, uh, keep my uh, stand on that. As for the topic of the income support arrangements, I think there is a big burden on the federations to financially assist players and the clubs that are struggling, already struggling with the uh, and coping, trying to cope with the damage that is caused by COVID-19. As you will all know, European football nations each getting 4.3 million euro from UEFA to spend as they see fit to rebuild the football community during this pandemic. On top of it, 500 million, 500 thousand dollar, half a million dollar from the FIFA for each football member association. Moreover, in Turkey, the Turkish Football Federation itself has 791 million Turkish lira annual income. And according to the May uh, 19, 2019 dated financial reports, that is. I strongly believe that the Turkish Football Federation should prepare a financial support program in this difficult situation uh, and uh, support the uh, players and the leagues. Also, uh, as I said, COVID-19 outbreak affected football as well as any other industry in Turkey. Revenue, revenues of the clubs decreased significantly and their contractual obligations to football players and other employees were significantly disturbed. Turkish clubs, which have already had difficult times in economic terms, feel the economic distress closely with the effect of this COVID-19. Temporary solution offers made by TFF, which only save the date and serves as a buffer. So it, is, it has not yet uh, touched the uh, players and the clubs yet. So to sum up, I would like to end my speech with uh, several issues that are going through my mind. I believe these are crucial questions that we need to ask to ourselves for each, uh, each of our countries. First of, for those clubs who are owned by multi-billionaires, how can you justify pressuring footballers to make a considerable wage cuts or salary deferrals? It may be up to the player to decide whether he would like to make this contribution to his multi-billionaire uh, club owner or not. Or maybe he can choose to make this contribution to a healthcare service that's, that he wishes to contribute to. Another point is that uh, insurance policy. Imagine a case where a player starts training and later playing and then he gets the COVID. What will be the fate of the insurance policies that uh, the club have uh, at hand? I believe as long as the clubs and the leagues follow the guidelines of the government, uh, insurance companies have to pay. But if they don't, as always, we should start thinking as lawyers about such matters. Lastly, uh, last of all, clubs, clubs also need to take in care of. At the end, they are the backbone of the football industry. They have no income, but huge expenses every day. Some, so some sort of a big government loan plan should be worked through together with the federation side league. Otherwise, there will be a big mess, big problems. I know sometimes problems are good for lawyers, but I don't think it's time for thinking about that aspect yet. So this is what I had to say about uh, the topic at hand. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Amin. Um, 
I appreciate all the idea you have and to open the debate. Um, I, I don't know if some uh, some of you have can pick up uh, a question. Um, is there someone who want to pick up the question of, I don't know, Daniel Cravo is, is asking a very long question, but Daniel, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity tomorrow to talk about that, but it's a very interesting question. You want some, you want to pick up a question? Maybe we can uh, give the floor to Jakub uh, Kizilkaya, who asked the question. Well, the question is, what do you think about the consequences of that if a player rejects to rejoin his team, although the league starts to continue? Who wants to answer this question? I touched on it slightly in, in my presentation in that, well, certainly under domestic law here, there are uh, protections if an employee has concerns, health and safety concerns that he would be protected under national law and clearly you have to balance that with you know the contractual obligations to to train and play but i think just commercially what how would clubs be perceived uh, if they were to turn around to a player um whether he be abroad or or in the uk who had genuine concerns about about resuming training and playing and said to him we want to try and force you to to do this it's you know it's going to be really negative PR particularly for for the club um, and so I think I think there's got to be this has got to be done on a consensual basis um, and I think the safeguards need to be in place really to give the players uh, the comfort of knowing that everything can be done to protect their own welfare so it's we're just going to have to see how things pan out certainly at a, a domestic level if we do resume our, our league how how this will develop. Yes, I think that health, health uh, is very important and uh, each country is uh, uh, looking at uh, protocol, uh, but uh, health could be very interesting, but also the responsibility of the employers and even the league in asking the player to go back uh, to train and, and uh, to compete. So this is um, also could be a very not only an interesting topic, but uh, we'll, we'll have probably litigation in the next uh, uh, months. Uh, yeah, well, just Jakub is online. Jakub, do you want to add something? Uh, no, thank you for your answers. But uh, the, the question is actually very hard to answer because uh, there will be some players to not come to trainings. So I will, I will, I will have guess and assumption to solve these problems in the clubs. So uh, I need your opinions also. Well, um, we have this issue already in Spain. A couple of players for the first division and uh, two or three of the second division said that they were not going at all to train. At all. Until we have a complete, complete assurance that we are not going to be um, infected. So. It's it's a matter of uh, of the one one self um, understanding of, of uh, protection. I mean, if the player said he's not protected or he doesn't want to play, I don't see I don't see how, as um, Emin has very well pointed out, is not a sport. The sport is not uh, something that is necessary. So unless unless you have a government decision like the one in France saying you don't play. The one in Spain saying you have to play because some, some days ago, uh, the Spanish government uh, reached an agreement with the Spanish league and the Spanish FA saying that sport and football mostly is 1.4% of the internal product in Spain. So they said, it's good for us, it's good for the economy and it's good for the uh, publicity of Spain to resume football. And if you have something like that, that they look, you have to resume football, it could be mandatory for the clubs to resume, but not for the players. I don't see the players going to play if they are not sure about their... And then, then you can say that maybe, maybe you can start some proceedings, some display proceedings, but 
I don't see that they, they will have a good end. Well, no, if, if I may, in that respect, I think it's also important to highlight the possible criminal liability that club directors have. Uh, we have, I suppose, like many countries, uh, health and safety legislation, which is quite severe. And obviously club directors are, uh, and, and rightfully, mainly concerned by uh, financial, the financial situation. But from a personal perspective, uh, at least with respect to Belgian legislation, and I, again, I assume it's similar in other countries, um, they face potential criminal liability if they cannot secure a safe and health work environment. So I think it's a parameter to take into account. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all of you. I think we can uh, uh, give the floor to Jacques Blondin, um, who has a question to, um, uh, for um, France, I think. Let me try to give him the floor. Hi everyone, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jacques. Uh, okay. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for giving me the floor. Yeah, I had a question for well, first of all, congratulations for the for the webinar. Very interesting. Also from the side of the institution, it's always nice to hear from 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 colleagues that work from the on the other side, no, of the barricade. Uh, very interesting indeed. Um, my question uh, was for Franz de Weger. Uh, during your um, your let's say, uh, explanations, France. You said that some clubs in uh, in the Netherlands are planning to lodge uh, an appeal in front of uh, a civil court because of this decision that was uh, taken. For what I understood by the Dutch Federation, by, by the KNVB, to finish the league without promotion and relegations. I understood that the uh, this the, the appeal will be lodged against these this second part of the decision, not to stop the league, but to not to um, provide for a relegation and a promotion system. But is this appeal going to be lodged before ordinary civil court or before a, a arbitration tribunal? Uh, my question is, uh, is based on the fact that FIFA statutes clearly prohibit or suggest actually to go to to arbitration tribunals rather than uh, uh, ordinary courts of justice. So this is my question. Since I don't know the, the, the Dutch system uh, and I don't know whether the uh, Dutch statutes uh, provide for uh, arbitration in that respect, I just wanted to know more about this, this potential appeal, whether it's going to indeed ordinary courts or, or some type of arbitration or even to CAS. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacques, for your question. I think it's a, a good question and it's clear. Um, in this case, it is a dispute between uh, the clubs with regard to the, uh, uh, the promotion and relegation, but it's a case against the Dutch FA. And because it's a case against the Dutch FA, you will have to go to the civil courts. Mm -hmm. Because normally when it's a case between members of the Dutch FA, for example, between two clubs or between a club and a, a player, etc., then indeed you have to go to the arbitration uh, court in the Netherlands. And we also provide for this in the Dutch regulations, the KNVB regulations. Uh, you cannot appeal this decision before the arbitration court, so you cannot go to CUS. It's a first instance the, uh, decision you will get. Uh, but because this is a case between uh, the clubs and the KNVB, you have to go to the civil courts. Um, there once was a case, I think it was a year ago, there was a case between a member club in the Netherlands also against the KNVB and they went directly to the Dutch arbitration court because they thought that was the correct instance to go to. Uh, but uh, the Dutch arbitration court said, well, I cannot handle the case, you have to go to the civil courts. So simply because this is a case between a member and the FA, the arbitration court will not deal with this, but you have to go to the civil courts. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. We, we in France, we have, we are facing the same situation in other sports and uh, in handball. And uh, I think we will face it in, uh, with uh, football if uh, 
the, the decision is to, to not to resume the competition. And in France, uh, this uh, uh, claim has to be lodged uh, before the administrative courts, since, uh, of course, in France, you, you know, we have a, a different system and sport is considered as a public uh, activity. And this has been already uh, uh, happening, uh, occurred in Handball, and, and some clubs are going and asking to administrative court to uh, um, look at this decision. No regulation, no relegation, and no prohibition. So I think it, it will be very interesting. And uh, I don't know if there are other questions uh, you want to pick up. Yes, maybe I can give the floor to Pedro Castro, uh, who has a long question, so I prefer that he asks it directly. If he's still online. Hello, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, hi Ronan, hi everyone. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, basically, I, I, I would have two questions, if you allow me, one specifically to Patricia uh, to follow up on, on her presentation. And, and if I understood correctly, Patricia said that uh, partial activity um, was no valid reason for termination. So my question is, is partial activity a valid reason for salary, salary reduction? Uh, in fact, the main reason, and 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 therefore a reason for for the others in relation to to national DRCs. So, in a scenario where a club is negotiating with the players for salary salary reduction, and it reached an agreement with most of them, but still a few reject, and the club is therefore considering unilateral decision to impose the salary reduction to everyone, to be fair, reasonable, and proportional. Um, but there are different contracts. So we have some contracts referring to FIFA and CAS, others referring to national DRC. It's obvious that FIFA DRC is very clear, uh, it will follow FIFA guidelines, but what happens on a national level? Will also national DRCs follow uh, FIFA guidelines uh, and therefore consider whether this unilateral decision was fair. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So to answer the first question, maybe uh, uh, was not clear enough. Partial activity, uh, which is actually an employment, temporary unemployment, it's a mechanism who it provides, the law provides that the, the employer, so the clubs, are allowed to impose a salary cut, 30% salary cut. The players and the coach, they, are, they, 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 they have to accept, they, are, they have no possibility to claim against this, okay? So uh, I can say, hearing at all my colleagues that French clubs are lucky <laughs> in, in the sense or that the French club they have the right from the law to reduce the salary and also uh, they save 30% and they also save all the social contribution which are very high in France on the 70% which are going to pay back, pay to the, to the, to the uh, players and they will get back from the government with a, a cap of 7,000 euro, which is important for small players. I mean, not small players, but the small wages, because it, it's for, for them, they save the all, the all amount. So this is the law, and it's a little bit uh, complicated. Some academics, I'm not sure that I agree with them, they think that since this mechanism exists, and since this mechanism uh, the purpose of the mechanism is to avoid layoff and to keep the employees in their contract, in their companies. It means that the employer cannot 
find a ground on the force majeure to terminate the contract because the judge will say, look, you have this opportunity to keep, to keep on an, the, 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 the contract and to continue the contract through the partial activity system. So you cannot say that the force majeure al allow you, it give you the impossibility to execute the contract. So I think it's clear, uh, but uh, this is the academic point of view regarding force majeure. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, for sure. I, I cannot say that a judge we, we're going to see because for, of course we will have litigation. I'm not sure that the big club with a very important player, they will not go to terminate the contract for sure. But maybe for some small clubs, it, they are looking after to save uh, uh, these wages by terminating the contract. So we're going to see. So for the, the other part of the question, I give the floor to who wants to, to answer this interesting question. Could, could you repeat the question, please? I don't, I don't remember the question. So, so basically, basically, it's a scenario where a club is trying to reach an agreement with the players. Um, it has uh, potentially reached an agreement with most of the squad, but there's still a few refusing. Uh, and therefore, the club is considering applying the salary cut to all players. So only a few have refused. So the club is, is, is considering, oh, I will apply to the entire squad because I want to be, to be fair with everyone. So FIFA guidelines um, give the answer. And, and, and of course, it's a recommendation to FIFA DRC uh, as to treat the, the policy of the club or the unilateral decision of the club as, as reasonable. And therefore, then they have some, some criteria, criteria there. But considering that the club can have different contracts with players, some referring to FIFA, some referring to national DRC for the dispute. So do you think that national DRCs will also follow the guidelines of FIFA? Thank you. Okay, if you don't mind, um, we, are not, we have no DRC in Spain, but we have courts. And I don't see, I don't see the court following FIFA guidelines, they would ask FIFA, what's FIFA? Uh, they would say, look, this is something that you, employer, you employee have to reach an agreement. If you don't reach an agreement, I'm sorry, but uh, it's not mandatory and the guidelines are not mandatory. So I, I, I see that if it's Spain, uh, FIFA guidelines have nothing to do. Yes, but what is it, it could be interesting that it's, uh, the, it is an international uh, case, meaning a foreign uh, player in a country and the player could find a ground to terminate the contract, thinking that the, the salary cut. So this will go to the DRC. Oh, no, Patricia. You yeah, it isn't international. Policy. Spain public policy. You can't go to FIFA. Yeah, but Spain is not the word. And some... <laughs> if you have Messi willing to, to end his contract in Barcelona, he can't go there. I mean, it's impossible. He has to go to Spanish court. Even if you're an international player. No way. I think he can go to DRC and DRC will recognize under Article 22 no. uh, his uh, jurisdiction. No, 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 no. So Neymar tried to do that and Neymar has to go back to the Spanish court. I'm sorry to say, this is clear, evident, 100%. Because it already happened. Neymar tried to go to FIFA and they said, no, go back to Spain. So come on, this is what happened. In Spain, there's no way you go to DRC in FIFA. Or if you go, you're going to lose. You're going to say inadmissible. So you think that the guidelines uh, of FIFA regarding uh, the situation of the DRC uh, looking at a case uh, is, are unrelevant, irrelevant? You have to go to the Spanish court and I can't see a judge following the guidelines. I mean, it will be case by case, of course. If the, the, the guy uh, everybody has signed an agreement with 10%, it's not that much. And the guy said, no, I don't want, I don't want to have anything. Maybe he can get into the good faith issue and say, look, you have to accept at least some something, 5%, but I don't see it. it's, it's something individual. And you can't force somebody 
to release part of your contract. I'd agree with with Juan in terms of you know you natural imposition of a of a pay cut, and also I suppose the the point is the FIFA guidelines are are guidelines and they do give deference to national law. So under English law, for example, there might be an argument that this would be an under unlawful deduction from wages. And if there isn't agreement, I'm sure the, the position might vary from country to country. But principally, if you haven't got agreement of the two parties, where is the basis for your, your deduction for, for the wages? Can I also add something, Patricia? Yes, please, take yeah. the floor. I think coming back to also to the question of uh, Pedro, um, of course, it will also depend on which applicable law is, is uh, which law is applicable. Uh, if this is, for example, the national law, I would say national law is leading also for the NDRCs, obviously, uh, which also follows from the from the FIFA guidelines eh, to respect the national laws first. Um, if the applicable law refers, for example, to FIFA regulations, I think there's more room to follow the, the guidelines also for the NDRC. Uh, but if we take a look at uh, the Netherlands, for example, there's always, even if Dutch law uh, applies to the contract, there's always some sort, they call it reflex actions, a sort of uh, indirect binding of the FIFA regulations uh, to take them into account. So I still think, uh, coming back to the question, whether an NDRC can take uh, the FIFA guidelines into account. Yes, I think they can, uh, but it's not mandatory uh, and, and they can uh, at least take this into account uh, as a sort of a reflex action. For sure, there is two questions. First, does FIFA has jurisdiction in case there is a termination of a contract between uh, a club and a player which has not the same nationality? another nationality which is a foreigner and the second is the applicable law for sure uh, if i'm talking about france uh, the applicable law will be french law and the french law uh, it, there is no way to uh, say that the club has the possibility to amend uh, the contract uh, even the question of the extension of the contract is very interesting because I think that there is no, uh, uh, except in Turkey, I was surprised to understand that in Turkey, the season, the contract, are, uh, the end of the contract is the end of the season and the end of the season can change. But in France, it's right, impossible to change uh, unilaterally the, the, the end of the contract. The, the amendment of the contract is right impossible without the consent of the player, the, of the employee. Like in Portugal. If I may add something, uh, I am I'm, I'm saying this uh, on a personal basis without uh, I mean uh, excluding that I may uh, I may be asked to decide the case at FIFA about it. But so please take my words as a personal opinion about it. Uh, considering the unique uh, nature of the current situation. I just invite everyone to think about um, the possibility to interpret the FIFA recommendations uh, as a, a way to interpret uh, the good faith in the performance of the contract and in the interpretation of contracts. So I, I cannot exclude, but again, it's a personal opinion of mine, both at national level and at international level, the sort of uh, the, 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 the guidelines of FIFA may be seen as a, not as a standard practice, but as a recommendation that is uh, given to the whole football family and as such as a, an interpretation tool to consider what is reasonable doing and what can be made to balance the interests of all concerned parties. So, again, I don't have certainty to give. I'm not taking positions of deciding bodies, of course, but I, I see this as a, a possibility. So I see the, the question very interesting. And uh, I, I would say that as of today, without knowing about 
uh, when football will start again. We cannot exclu exclude that the FIFA uh, standards may be used also in courts or in uh, and NDRC or something like this. Uh, we can try to give the floor to Mr. Tulongayo Guashu Belwe. I'm sorry for this pronouncing pronouncing of that name. Uh, Well, I don't see him, so maybe he left. Uh, maybe the question from Daniel Cravo, I, I will try to uh, sum it up. It's about the uh, image rights agreements. Uh, I don't know if they are used in some of your countries, but are they, um, could they be an alternative to the clubs to save money in cases uh, uh, the relevant agreements open this door? Because we see that for the salary, it's sometimes quite difficult. Maybe the image rate rights agreements can give some possibilities. Are there? Is there, is there anyone? anyone? I, I can say that in France, uh, image rates, if, if it's a contract between the club and the player, uh, it's not different. It's uh, considered as a salary. So if it's the same uh, two parties, uh, it's, there is no difference between the wages and the image rights. They, they are uh, under the same uh, contract. And uh, even if there is two contracts, they will be considered as a wages. And uh, there is no way to save uh, money uh, uh, more on the wages than on the, on the image rights than on the wages. It's exactly the same, but maybe, um, some other colleagues want to yes carol yeah certainly in england um there would be the image rights company um having an, agree an agreement with the club and i think purely on the basis of force majeure um being we would have to provide for that to be included in a contract and it's obviously not included in our playing contracts but there may be more likelihood that a force majeure provision might be included in these more commercial agreements. So I certainly think that there may be more provisions there to provide for reduction of, of payments or um, a, a suspension of payments. And it's more likely to set out the circumstances in which uh, payments won't be due. So I actually think that that image rights, it'll just have to be based on a case by case basis uh, in the UK at least. Okay, we have online Mr. Gaushu Belwe. Can you hear? Oh no, you, we cannot hear you. We see you, but we cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe we will try to have someone else. Um, Mr. Rashid Bouamra, who has a question about um, England and uh, Wales. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we could. We can hear you. Hi, uh, thank you for hosting uh, this afternoon as well. Um, my question's mainly aimed at uh, Carol, but it can also be opened up to the floor. Um, I was wondering, with regards to some loan agreements and some future player transfers have been pre-agreed, uh, such as the ZH uh, transfer from Ajax to Chelsea. Um, would those players still be able to play should the league be resumed at a later date? Um, or would it have to be with the squad as it is um, from previous on this season? Uh, thank you. Carol, do you want to... Carol, she's not anymore here. Can't he see her. Um, that's one thing. We, we will address this topic in a future uh, IAF webinar. 
um, um, about uh, loans and transfers. So, but it's, anyway, it's a very interesting question. I don't know if someone, maybe Juan, you want to answer this question? Carol is back. So maybe Carol can... Sorry, the computer went. I didn't catch the question. It was, was, was it about um, if players are due to come back from loan, how do they become part of the squad outside of the... Yeah, ultimately, I think the Premier League is going to have to review its, its regulations. And if it is the case that, that players coming back from, from loan at the, 30, at the 30th of June, um, ultimately, if there isn't an agreement to extend that loan, they will be looking to re-register with, with the club. Uh, so then it's for, for the Premier League clubs to decide if they're going to make amendments to, to the regulations to provide for that possibility, I think. If that answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Carol. Okay. So I think that maybe we will uh, close the session if Renan, it's okay for you? Yeah, I think so. I think, I, I, I think there are uh, very interesting questions, but you will have the opportunity to uh, we keep uh, get in contact and to, to share our questions and our experience. Um, uh, tomorrow, uh, we will have another very interesting uh, IF webinar on the same topic. It will be uh, at 2 p.m. Buenos Aires time, which is uh, a little bit late for European country, but uh, we had to, 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 to fix uh, in order to allow the maximum person. It will address the same topic in Latin America and Central America. Uh, countries with uh, IF speakers, greater IF speakers. And the day after, on Thursday, uh, 2 p.m. Dubai time, you will have the opportunity to um, um, listen at our dealer colleagues from Asia, Africa, and Middle East. So tomorrow, the uh, IF webinar will be moderated by uh, Rodrigo uh, Ortega Sanchez, uh, from uh, uh, Argentina, and Thursday the IF webinar will be uh, moderated by uh, Saleh Alobedli uh, from EAU. Uh, Ronan will be uh, here uh, dealing with all the technicals and the organization. Thank you very much, Ronan. It was our first webinar. We, it was successful thanks to you. Thank you to all my dear colleagues for being participating and preparing uh, this IF webinar. And as I said, we are looking forward to having another one. Uh, maybe things will change in the next week or in two weeks. Um, and we can focus on transfer uh, uh, window, the loan, and uh, uh, all these uh, very interesting uh, uh, issue and question. Thank you very much to all. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Good Thank evening. You. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Grazie. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.